Welcome, everybody. It's showtime. Welcome to Chill Skills Sporland Tech Talks. The topic for this episode is supermarket liquid line components, catch all filter dryers. This is the third in a series of presentations that will follow the agenda of the old supermarket seminars, if you remember those. In the past, Sporland had a team of professionals on a supermarket team that went around the country to facilitate these presentations in person. With this Tech Talk entry, we're bringing the supermarket seminar concept back and hopefully serving a bigger audience in the process. Just so that you know, the next Tech Talk will be on February 19th, 2020. It will cover another facet of liquid line components, the mechanical subcoolers. Just a few instructions. If the speaker on your computer doesn't work, maybe you ought to throw it away, but I'm just kidding there. You can simply dial in. Yeah, there should be a phone number somewhere on the invitation that you received for this presentation, this webinar that we're doing. Please mute your microphone. And as we move along, if you have any pertinent questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A window and we'll try to address them live. And just so that you know, this webinar is being recorded, or at least that's what we think it is. Uh, Facebook Live, it will be posted there for your listening pleasure first. Uh, here's the good part. Here are the two good looking guys that are speaking today. They could both easily be mistaken for either George Clooney or Brad Pitt. But alas, hello, I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineer for the Sportland Application Team. That's me on the left. My stunt double and technical backup today is Glenn Steinkaney. Glenn is the contaminated, I mean, contaminant controls product manager. And yes, he collects a paycheck from Sporlin as well. Say hi, Glenn. Hello, everybody. How are you today? If you have any follow-up questions or feedback as we move through this, you can always contact us via email or contact the Sporlin Technical Support Team at svdtechsupport at parker.com. Or, wow, you can also call 636-239-1111 and a human, at least I think she's human, will answer the phone and direct you over to technical support. Now, we're starting to get into the meat of things here. Here is the basic refrigeration system depicted with all the primary components. There are four primary components, and they've just now been highlighted. So what are they? Well, there's the compressor. It compresses low pressure and low temperature vapor and turns it into a high pressure and temperature vapor. This creates the low and high sides of the system, thus enabling phase changes to take place in the refrigerant and for refrigeration to actually take place. Over here, I'm gonna use my fancy pointer, there's the condenser. This is the high temp, high pressure temperature heat exchanger and it, is, and it rejects heat to the ambient, whether that ambient be air or water or whatever, Vapor condenses to liquid, and through this process, the temperature is constant if no glide exists in the refrigerant. And the pressure is somewhat constant if there is little or no pressure drop actually through the condenser itself. We'll move on over here to the metering device. In this particular example, we've depicted a thermostatic expansion valve, but this thing works in conjunction with the compressor. It's equipped with a small orifice and exhibits a high pressure drop. Liquid changes from 100% liquid to a saturated liquid and vapor mix with that high pressure drop in the enthalpy. Wow, that's a $10 word, isn't it, Glenn? Yes, it, it is. is relatively constant. This device can be a thermostatic expansion valve, an automatic expansion valve, a fixed tube orifice, a capillary tube, and the list goes on. Over here resides the evaporator. This is the low temperature, low pressure heat exchanger, and the refrigerant absorbs heat from the refrigerated space. Refrigerant boils here, changes phase. This is where things will really cool off. It should be 100% vapor when it leaves the evaporator outlet, at least wise if it's a DX system, that should be the case. Here, we've got the modern temp rack depicted. It, it can seem quite advanced and a little complicated, and each one's a little different. In this particular example, you're gonna always see mostly the four primary components. And there's one of them that's not depicted here, and we'll figure that out as we go along. But generally the compressor, the condenser, the metering device, and the evaporator will all be present in these complicated systems. Some installations have multiple distributed racks throughout the installation. For instance, you'd see that in a supermarket or a store. 
Other designs include one or more compressor racks in a mechanical room with split suctions intended to satisfy both low and medium temp refrigerated cases. And these systems may include different refrigerants, condenser types, unloading devices, subcoolers, heat reclaims, split condenser valves, head pressure control. Here you can see compressors, compressors, control panels, an oil separator, oil reservoir over here in this side. Yeah, there, yeah. And even some of our pressure differential valves. This particular system is situated in our engineering lab here in good old Washington, Missouri. You treat us real nice, you can come, on, come by and actually take a look at it sometime. Now here, we have a schematic representation of that vapor compression refrigeration cycle with all the main components. The, the heat rejection device, the low temperature heat exchangers, the compressors, the metering devices, all of that is here. It can seem quite thwarting and overwhelming, but we're going to drill down. We're gonna talk about just this section of the system today. And in fact, we're gonna specifically talk about contaminant controls, the catch-all filter dryer. And here you can see that we've situated a filter dryer at the inlet of each solenoid valve that's hand handling the liquid before it enters the expansion valve. In this particular case, those are providing a special level of protection to the expansion valve. These catch-alls, which is Sporland's brand name for their unique filter dryer, are placed in each one of these positions to provide insurance so that we keep the system clean and, and dry. Also, we have a, you'll note, a replaceable core catch-all installed over in this vicinity. This helps to clean up the liquid line and helps the entire system in general. The catch-all is built to remove contaminants from the refrigeration system and protect system components. Anything in the system besides refrigerant and lubricant, eh, sometimes they'll call it oil, uh, is considered a contaminant. At least that's our contention. The catch-all filter dryer removes moisture, acid, sludge, varnish, and wax from the system. So what is contamination? As you can see on this slide, we're talking about material that shouldn't be in the system at all. From copper oxide to moisture, you name it. Waxy material plugging up TEVs. These materials reduce system performance and in the worst case scenario can result in system failures. But hold on, we've got good news for you. We've learned how to alle alleviate these nasty problems because we're smart like that. At least Glenn is. Here's, here is a slide starts to drill into what those primary contaminants are and what problems they can cause. And this is probably a good time for Glenn to do some talking. Glenn, tell us about this. All right, Jim. Well, in general, what we have as the kind of the worst case scenario are these types of contaminants. You don't necessarily see them in every system, but if you do see them, they will cause you problems. So the worst one, as I've hovered over the water, is actually water. And the reason it is water is because <clears throat> it will react and it will form acids and it can actually form solid debris as well when it reacts with other materials. Remember, water is, you know, uh, very common in our environment and our body uses it and it reacts with those as well. So that's why water is so bad because it loves to react. And once it reacts, it doesn't go back. It destroys the lubricant if that's what it reacts with, or it destroys the metal of the system components. And of course, that's not really what you want. Now, one of those things that it can turn into is acids. And those acids are never good because acids really like to react as well. And they actually will react with most metals. They can react with sealed materials causing external leaks or other problems. Um, and they can come from a variety of sources. Our most common uh, problems are when it comes from after a compressor burnout, uh, which or a, a high compressor discharge temperature situation, which you might ex uh, experience with low charge conditions sure. or something of that, that kind nature. Of stuff. Absolutely. And then the last thing that water or acid can do is it can turn into solid debris, wow. as well as having debris that we get into the system when we first build it or when we assemble it together. Nice job, Glenn. You know what? You're speaking at a real nice pace. People can understand you. Types of desiccant. Well, you know, this is really just a continuation of what you've already told us about, right? 
So we've got to eliminate these problems. Appropriate materials are deployed in the catch-alls, unique core to remove these pesky contaminants. Molecular sieve here, you know, very effective at removing moisture from the system. Activated aluminum, very effective in targeting acid because of the size of the molecules. Over here, activated carbon is able to remove oil breakdown material and waxy substances. I've always wondered what, what's oil breakdown material? Does that mean the oil's quit doing its thing? Well, it does actually, Jim, because it's been deformed or damaged by some other event or contaminant so that it nor does not have the ability to provide the lubricity Got to those moving components that it should be providing. We probably ought to do an entire webinar on lubricants. We probably should at some point. That'd be something interesting. Filter dryer construction varies by manufacturer and even within a single manufacturer's own product line. Here's an example of what we call a loose fill or compacted bead filter dryer. Over time, loose filled versions like this one can experience something called desiccant attrition. The desiccant beads rub up against one another due to refrigerant flow and some small particles can actually be released into the system. These small particles can reach the TV and other control valves and cause all kinds of restrictions. Now, the molded core, in contrast to loose-filled filter dryers, the catch-all deploys a unique blend of desiccants in a molded core and is known for having superb filtration and industry-leading acid and moisture removal capacity. The solid core design makes the difference compared to the loose-filled competitors. This kind of sounds like I'm doing a TV commercial, Glenn. <laughs> the molded core will filter solid particulates down to 40 microns. It adds absorbs moisture and acid into the structure of the core. The final outlet pad and the perforated plate add filtration and support. With this somewhat new design, the sealed model catch-all is capable of removing particles down to 20 microns. It's considered good practice to install a catch-all filter dryer ahead of the TV in every instance. It's simply good insurance to utilize catch-alls to protect those TVs and other control valves. You'll note here that there have been a few design changes in somewhat recent times. The shape of the core, the shape of the core outlet have been adjusted. Here you'll see our replaceable core model. Large systems typically use replaceable core style catch-alls. The replaceable core products are generally larger compared to the seal models. And that kind of makes sense. The, this allows the technician to service the system by replacing the core and or optional secondary filter. Here's that secondary filter right there. As opposed to the entire unit, like you would have to do with a sealed model catch-all. The optional secondary filter is really a good addition to the system in conjunction with POE solvents. Oh, I mean, POE lubricants, right? Isn't it POE lubricants, Glenn? That is true, but they do exhibit really good solvent characteristics. They like to pick up stuff off of the tubes and off of other things and move them around in the system, which is never good for moving parts. Yeah. Well, that secondary filter helps to clean up afterwards. Like the seal models, the replaceable core catch-all enables filtration to 40 mi microns. With the addition of that optional secondary filter, that enables filtration clear down to 20 microns. Am I making that up? Is that for real? No, that's for real, Jim. And just to give you an idea what a 40 microns is like. Yeah, what's that like? That's about the average diameter of the human hair on the, on the top of your head. Okay. So a 20 micron is even half of that size. So we're really capturing I, down to those I don't have particles. much hair in my head anymore. So can we talk about another place? Well, we'll okay, talk maybe, about maybe someone not. else's head. Maybe, oh, there, that's probably a good idea. So these are just as effective as the seal model catch-all, right? That is absolutely correct. Awesome. <laughs> Commissioning effectively. Can you tell us about commissioning effectively, Glenn? Well, everyone knows when you buy something, you want it to work absolutely correct right out of the gate when you first fire it up. Well, so do all of our customers in, at the, in the grocery stores and supermarkets. So in order to get that, ideally what you should do is you should actually clean up that system, you know, right at the get-go. You know, it's got a lot of joints, so there's a lot of potential oxides being formed. And uh, 
other things that could be in there, such as water, moisture, etc. So if you eat, clean those up very effectively at the beginning, then you can uh, ensure the system works well going forward. So what does that really mean? You know, it means going in there, making sure you dry out all the moisture and that the see all or the liquid and moisture indicator actually shows a dry condition. Uh, make sure that you're not seeing pressure drop developing continuously over the liquid line filter dryer to ensure that all solid debris has been captured. You know, and then make sure that there's no acid, which in this case, you're just starting up, there should be no acid, but that could be double checked just as well. Once you've done all of that, you make sure that you renew that protective capability by replacing all those units with your new liquid line cores, secondary filter, or even uh, second uh, suction line cores or filters. However, your customer prefers to protect their system long-term or you as a servicing technician. Sounds like a deal. What's this bulletin over here? Is this something that customers can acquire from us? Uh, the bulletin just simply explains about that little bit about that secondary filter that provides that 20 micron capability, which is somewhat unique in the industry and only available through your Sporland wholesalers. Fair enough. I, for a minute, thought this maybe was a misnomer over here because we got secondary filter and then our abbreviation for it is like filter secondary. But, you know, that's how we do things. Well, if you had it as uh, SF first, it might confuse you with our suction filters. Sure. Got it. Makes sense to me. Oh, here's some interesting information. We've got special cores for special jobs. Over here, we've got on the left, we got the old ubiquitous RC4864. The original RC4864 was a, a blend of desiccants was designed to remove moisture and acid from mineral oil-based systems. It's, it's an excellent system protector against moisture, acid, and contamination. POE lubricant, however, is very hygroscopic. Hygroscopic? What does hygroscopic mean, Glenn? I don't know. It means it likes to hold water. Ah, okay. Fair enough. And POE-based systems can exhibit high moisture levels because of that. The RCW48, which is over here on the right, has a blend of desiccants designed to remove larger amounts of moisture and moderate amounts of acid. This makes the RCW48 a good choice for use with POE systems. The RCW is the preferred choice for moisture removal or water, if you will. Now, within the next six months, maybe as late as June of this year, Sporland will revise the description of the RC4864 over here to say RCA48 for simplification purposes similar to the way we've monikered the RCW48 over here. This name will mean replaceable core acid. This is Sporland's primary weapon for acid removal. Primary weapon for acid removal. And just so you know, the 48 refers to the volume of desiccant included in the core in terms of our units of cubic inches, which is kind of neat. And there you can see little animation that makes that a little more steadfast. The traditional core for moderate moisture and high acid capacity and over here the RCW core we've got the high moisture and medium acid capacity version. Waxy substances. Waxy substances often plug low temp R22 systems. Waxy substances can travel in solution with refrigerant and oil. Sounds like they travel in packs, Glenn. They do actually. The wax actually is in solution in the lubricant itself, not actually in the uh, refrigerant. Wow. Wax is generally not realized until the refrigerant experiences pressure drop during the expansion process, causing the substance to precipitate out a solution and collect at the pin in the port of an expansion valve, like we're depicting here. And what we oftentimes say, if you don't have a good filter in a system, that thermostatic expansion valve is going to act as a good secondary one for you. Absolutely. Note the source of the wax in the first place could be residual process fluids, paste flux, drawing oil, you know, the, resem the remnants of manufacturing process, and even the deterioration of the lubricant used in the system. Mineral oil itself in those systems that use it contains some amount of paraffin wax. Uh, that's what I understand anyway. 
Yep, we just want to keep it at a low enough level that it doesn't come out and cause uh, expansion valve problems. Right. Systems that run high condensing pressures and temperatures are likely to generate oil breakdown stuff, or simply said, the oil or the lubricant will have failed. That is now no longer a lubricant and will likely cause system problems. Oil breakdown also tends to collect at the TEV pin and port, like we've already said, and it'll affect the operation of that valve. You know, it kind of looks like we're building a case for a special kind of core to clean this up. Ah, look at there. Here it is. The RC4864HH is effective at removing oil breakdown material and waxy substances. It is also capable of removing acid, moisture, sludge, varnish, and wax in oil breakdown. Acid and moisture removal capacity is reduced compared to the RC4864 and the RCW48 cores because some of those desiccants are displaced by the activated carbon present in the HH core. Do we want to, you have a question there, Glenn, that's why you're frantically waving at me? <laughs> we do, Jim. Uh, what do we have? have? We have a question about why dryers were ineffective in the issue we had a few years ago uh, where we had to use other types of materials to actually help out with uh, cleaning up those systems or keeping the TEV clean. I can speak to that quite oh, you clearly. Can. Oh, can yes, you I can. now? I don't even know what they're talking about. Okay. I kind of do. Yeah, go <clears throat> for it, Glenn. Go for it. All right. um, as part of that problem we had a few years ago, the issue lied in the fact that the, one of the materials in the uh, system component that caused some of this issue actually was not quite an acid, nor was it quite a water, and nor was it quite a wax. It actually had a very, very unique chemical structure that made it a little more difficult to capture with standard components. Now, what we did do is we did a bunch of experiments to see what would happen, and we could actually clean it up over 50% of the time using a standard HH type product. Now, what happened was uh, we actually got to a point in the industry where we found what the problem was and resolved it very fairly quickly. Uh, seemed like forever because it was months, mm -hmm. uh, but the investigation was pretty quick. Uh, and what we found was it was just a slightly bit uh, easier to resolve it using another material that was added to the system to give just that hint more of solubility to this material. Um, but over the long haul, we have found that that has not necessarily always solved the problem. So we still recommend going back and doing it using the HH style core where the uh, activated carbon did actually capture that material fairly well. You know, if I recall, that was a really good example of how a thermostatic expansion valve can act as a secondary filter to remove contaminants from the flow stream in the system because they sure plugged up a lot of thermostatic expansion valves with this, if I recall correctly. That is correct. And it didn't matter whether it was one of our thermostatic expansion valves or another manufacturer's valves. It really no fault of the thermostatic expansion valve. It was an excellent example of, of a contaminant being in the flow stream. You know, continuing to, to discuss this, here's just, you know, the bottom line with the HH core. If you don't have a clue regarding the crap uh, stuff that's in the system that might be causing havoc for you, uh, the HH core is the selection for contaminant removal in that situation. I think that's a really good uh, ex example of how you can deploy this core and make things happen. You know, I, I got a question for Glenn. He didn't know I was going to ask this, but you know, we're, we're, we've got the RCW48. We're eventually going to have the RCA48. And I was just wondering if we're going to have the RCHH48 to simplify this one as well, but that may not be the case. You want to comment on that in any way, Glenn? Um, in this case, where we're looking at doing a lot of cleanup, both on the liquid line side, but you can also use it on the suction line side. Uh, we don't intend to follow the liquid line nomenclature to move the HH in front of the RC uh, because we do uh, uh, understand that, that uh, 
the surface area of this core, meaning the 64 uh, cubic inch or square, square inches, inches of surface area, has a meaningful uh, purpose on the suction Got line it. side. Got it. Well, I, I know I've already fielded that question, and I thought I'd just bring it up in this context and deal with it. So that's a mm -hmm. good answer there. I get it completely. Sporlins TA1, the acid test kits, are available in the market to determine the quantity of acid in the system. That's another pesky contaminant that can, that can take place. So how do you determine how much acid is in a system? Well, here's what you do. You take an oil sample. You mix with the correct vial to create a solution. Now here's where you got to have good eyesight. You compare the color to the chart. The kit is intended for single use. You know, I used to joke, Glenn, that, that way we get to sell more of them. Uh, <laughs> additional vials are provided for POE lubricants, as well as mineral and alkyl benzene oil systems. When the acid level is high, the catch-all filter dryer should be changed and monitored until that acid level gets back down to an acceptable level. Then replace the used catch-all to replenish the ability in that system to remove and hold contaminants. Now, here shortly, we're going to discuss an answer to a question that we get asked on occasion, and that is when to change the catch-all. So you just hang on. We're going to get there shortly. That's nothing to do with either of our heights, by the way. Moisture levels in a system can increase over time. Moisture is another one of those pesky contaminants. The Sporlin Seal Moisture Liquid Indicator identifies when system moisture reaches a cautionary or even dangerous level. The reversible indicator changes from green to chartreuse. Is that really a color, chartreuse? Apparently it is. Yeah, from green to chartreuse to yellow as moisture levels increase. If the see-all indicator remains yellow, a new catch-all filter dryer should be installed in the system. Prior to installation, a new see-all will likely exhibit chartreuse or yellow color due to the humidity inside the sea all. And I guess that's due to humidity that's actually in the ambient. That is correct. Yeah. And, and, and will, once that's installed in a system and it has some time to run, that might very well clear up to a green color. But once installed and you've got a deep vacuum pool, the moisture indicator should turn back to green unless you still got moisture or water in the system. It will change color to indicate the actual system moisture level once the system's had some runtime. We think that's usually around 12 hours. And Jim, that's really a function of the system and the refrigerant being able to grab the moisture from its hiding places and uh, compressor windings or other system materials, including even still just on the surfaces of some of the metals. And it takes a while for that to get pulled off by the refrigerant and transported to the to the uh, see all and of course to the catch all so that it can uh, um, uh, be cleaned up and then show an accurate level. Good deal. Yep. You know, another feature of the see all is the uh, liquid indicator feature that's built into it. See alls installed in the liquid line will allow the contractor or service technician to see a full column of liquid or vapor bubbles in the liquid line indicating a saturated condition in absence of subcooling at that point. One or the other. That's kind of a neat feature. Mm -hmm. Answer to the million dollar question. Uh, when to install a new catch-all? There are conditions that would require and mandate that and we're gonna kind of run through those. You should install a new catch-all anytime when installing a new system. What could be better? Start out clean from the get-go. You install a new catch-all anytime the system has been entered for service or repair. You install a new catch-all uh, when the existing catch-all filter dryer exhibits excessive pressure drop. We think that's around 5 psi. Or the liquid subcooling has completely vanished. And you could partially determine that by looking at the seal. And the seal indicates moistures in the system with a caution to wet color warning. Uh, you install a new catch-all anytime the Testol TA1 acid test kit indicates acid is present. You install a new catch-all anytime the compressor has burned out. Ouch. And a cleanup is underway. 
In fact, it's good practice to install an oversized catch-all in the liquid line in that case. Again, you would install a new catch-all anytime the compressor has burned out, a cleanup is underway, and in fact, maybe you would even want to install a suction line catch-all to remove acids and debris more expeditiously from the system and keep an eye then on the pressure drop here in the suction line. Is that anything that you want to elaborate upon, Glenn, in that case? Absolutely. With uh, the reason we use the suction line catch-all to capture and clean up after a compressor burnout, um, we, uh, we see that the lubricant is in its own phase on the suction line side. Remember, it's gas. The refrigerant's a gas. Mm -hmm. The, the lubricant's a liquid, and it gets very intimate contact with the uh, desiccants inside the catch-all, and so that it can capture those acids. And remember, we use activated alumina for that. Gets that intimate contact, does a great job of capturing it much more quickly than, say, on a on the liquid line, where you might have, where you also have, I should say, the liquid refrigerant diluting that uh, lubricant. Um, and then also, anytime you have acids in your system, you're trying to get it out faster. So you can do that with both locations, liquid line and suction line, uh, and get those out quickly. Now, the suction line pressure drop is much more detrimental to system efficiencies and capacities. So if you have too much pressure drop on the suction line, you can have problems. So that's why during a major compressor burnout, you should be observing and monitoring that pressure drop routinely during that first, you know, a uh, couple of hours of runtime. And if it doesn't seem like it's going up so fast, then you can come back in a day and double check to see if you've cleaned up all that acid that was in the during a burnout. And of course, Jim, after you've done that burnout cleanup, you know, the catch-all is a filter. It's captured a bunch of things. So yeah. it only has so much capability in it, it. and it should be replaced to ensure going forward it can I, capture anything get, else coming in. I think I've got this figured out. It's kind of like toilet paper. You use it, you throw it away. That's pretty much the truth. I might have like likened it more to the filters on the air side of oh, the system as oh, well. Oh, okay. Oh, you know? sure. But uh, makes uh, sense to, to me. To each their own, Jim. Thank you. You know, and we had animation built into this that we could have stepped through this, but apparently you and I weren't smart enough to use that. But nonetheless, good points. And there's just one last caveat that I think I'll add to this. In the rare occasion that you've got, say, a small self-contained system that's moisture, contaminant, leak-free, and it happens to have a nice filter dryer installed on it, is there any reason to disrupt that and change that filter dryer if there's good performance being had with it and you're not experiencing a leak or you've not had to do any major service on it? Absolutely not, Jim. As a matter of fact, we've seen more problems if you have a well-running system that is leak-free and dry, you're li less likely to have issues if you just leave it alone and let it run because it's sealed. It's not getting a lot of things in there until something else changes, where there's a leak or something like that, where you can get moisture inside. A major temperature, high temperature or event. A major sure. high temperature event, only in that case. Otherwise, we've designed them to work well with those systems for the for their full life of that system. Got it. Well, I just thought that was worth discussing because it's come up before. Here we've got a little more troubleshooting that we can we can elaborate upon briefly. Uh, flash gas at the TV inlet. Where does the flash gas originate? Well, you can check one place for pressure drop across the filter dryer. If there's excessive pressure drop, you replace the filter dryer. We've talked about that being five PSI and say a liquid line. In a suction line situation, it might be considered less than that. Uh, check the reservoir for a low refrigerant charge. Uh, TV strainers might be clogged. Flash gas cannot be detected in that case. How are we doing on questions, Glenn? Has anybody else posed a question or a chat issue or anything of that nature to us? Oh, uh, we have no current we're questions good. at this moment. And we're going to keep cranking along nicely. Uh, maintain proper refrigerant charge in the system. Uh, low charge leads to compressor cooling, uh, causing excessive compressor operating temperatures. Oil and refrigerant degrades, forming acid, causing compressor damage and failure. Uh, 
you want to fix leaks and stop that loss, stop that bleeding, and then go back and do the good service techniques. Now we have a line of products in the smart service tool range, including the smart pro R with those extended antennas that can make charge analysis quick and easy, just as it says there. So that's a little plug for that. We have a new question. We do actually. So the question is, is there any concern on dryers associated with the industry's use of sealants to deal with system leaks, mostly in evaporators? Oh, would wow. You, go go well, for Jim, it. Jim, we did talk about that a little bit earlier, how anything that you put into the system, other than the refrigerant, you know, obviously doing the heat transfer and the, and the lubricant doing the compressor uh, lubrication, uh, really outside of that is really somewhat of a contaminant. Now, do we know if those contaminants are all, or if those are going to cause problems in every system? No, but here's one other thing we don't know, Jim. We don't know what else might have gotten into that system <laughs> at some point. So how do they interact? Uh, quite honestly, it could be quite large number of different ideas. Um, uh, so that also then gets to another question we just had. Yeah. Talking what about dyes and stop, you know, the, the other question is also about stop leak additives. Oh, so we got another question came in almost similar kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So dyes serve a purpose, find the problem uh, sources of leaks and get rid of them. But once again, they can actually, you know, potentially react with something else in the system. Uh, we don't necessarily condone though any of those types of materials because we can't tell you what's in the system and what it's going to react with. Makes sense to me. Yep. Do we have another question in there too? Yeah. What is uh, this one? So the question on this one is, is, you may want to mention that if you use an oversized liquid line dryer on close coupled package systems, the technician will actually need to compensate for the extra liquid holding capacity of the dryer. Interesting. That is exactly correct. Once you put more volume into that liquid line and you got to fill that with liquid, you have to add refrigerant charge to make that happen. Once again, that's where you can go back to set up your system, look at your seal to make sure that mm -hmm. you don't have any flash gas in your seal. Double check to make sure you have proper subcooling and superheat, right. you know, uh, to ensure to the manufacturer's recommendations. What a deal. Well, I, I, on this slide here, I'm really supposed to say it's the core that counts. But what I want to know, does it really go like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I don't think it does. No. Most cores don't have the capability of counting. Um, which they just, they're just important is what that's trying to mean. And, for, and, and Glenn, you know what? Uh, we're starting to wrap up and get close to the end here. At this point, I'm supposed to say things like, if we've set this up correctly, we've actually recorded this whole affair. And if that's the case, you can view an encore performance of this webinar on Facebook rather quickly. Uh, and, and you can do so right away, or you can wait for YouTube when we get around to posting it there. Uh, eventually, we'll get it out on YouTube, and you can view it again and again, or even for the first time, for that matter. This kind of highlights that you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can call our technical support at 636-239-1111. Uh, you can even send an email to us at svdtechsupport at parker.com. Uh, we've got a uh, variety of support information for you in terms of technical support, product literature, training, even our virtual engineer software package that helps you to size and select tools uh, at spoiling.com. And we've been getting questions, so apparently everyone's figured out how to do that. And if you fail to get your question into us on time, uh, you can put your questions out there on Facebook Live and we'll respond to them. As a reminder, coming up next month on February the 19th, we'll cover additional liquid line components, the mechanical subcoolers. And we are getting down here to the wire. Glenn, this time's gone really fast. Uh, I'm just putting in another another plug here. Uh, if if we've if we missed your question, we'll get it online. You got another question here? We got a little bit of time left that we could handle it. We do have one question on whether it is safe to add a filter dryer in front of a hot gas bypass valve. Now, that is a... Uh, <clears throat> you go for it. All right. Um, 
it is acceptable to use a filter dryer in front of a hot gas bypass valve uh, as long as you ensure that the pressure drop across the unit is not such that it would cause problems with the flow through the, the uh, hot gas bypass valve. Um, but, but gosh, I mean, what's the likelihood that you're going to pull any moisture out of that? You're not going to pull any moisture. It's it simply act, would be a filter. It's a filter. There's maybe other ways to do that. Right. Uh, ordinarily, we don't advocate that, do we? That we don't. We don't. We don't push that. At no, all. we certainly don't push it. You should have adequate protection with the putting it in the liquid line and that and would be those a good things. thing to do. And okay. so that's really the best place for it. Um, Fair enough. Well, I I think that's the last of the questions that we've hit so far. If there's any questions that come in afterwards, you can always put them out there on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll respond to them. This really concludes liquid line components, catch-all filter dryers. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Sporland Chill Skills Tech Talk, and we'll see you next month.